Yeah, so thank you from my side as well, everyone uh, for joining today. Um, thank you, Larita, for introductions. And yeah, this is a Star Wars themed presentation uh, about managing hybrid cloud. Uh, we do hope that you find today's content valuable as well as fun. Uh, so again, I'm Alex. I'll be taking you through the first part of the presentation before handing it then over uh, to Joe. So yeah, here, here is our agenda for today. Uh, we'll start with the current state of hybrid cloud, the current trends, um, and we'll then move on to uh, introduce our proven microfocus approach to cloud management, and then focus more specifically on, let me actually follow along with the rocket here. <laughs> Uh, then, yeah, we'll focus more specifically on uh, fulfillment, provisioning, as well as on public cloud cost optimization and compliance aspects. Uh, hope, hopefully you find that interesting. Then next we'll discuss uh, results uh, from the analyst and from the customer perspective. And since we released HCMX on SAS just about two months ago, we'll then discuss some of the, uh, the benefits of this uh, SAS release and as well as the roadmap of what's coming in the very near uh, future. Uh, then, of course, Q&A at the very end. And as Rita also mentioned, uh, at, uh, the exciting Star Wars uh, games and prizes. So uh, hopefully you, you stick around for that. All right, so let's start with just a brief, simple overview of what even is a cloud management solution? Uh, we may have a mixed audience. So um, it may also be called cloud management platform, or maybe you heard the term uh, cloud management tooling or similar. Those are all- uh, Hey Gil, give me just a minute to see if I can figure out how to mute this. Oh, encapsulated here. Uh, here we have a, a voice in the audience. So yeah, if everyone could put yourself on, uh, on mute would be, would be great. Um, all right. so. With that, as we're talking about the cloud management solution, uh, this is aimed at larger size organizations or companies uh, to assist with the management of cloud environments of today. And this is to help manage hybrid cloud. Um, hybrid clouds here includes private clouds, uh, multi, -pub uh, multi public clouds. Um, and um, just, just, a, just a note on that one is hybrid refers to private and public cloud and multi refers to multiple public clouds, uh, but sometimes those terms are kind of used interchangeably. So first we have here provisioning, uh, deploying as well as managing infrastructure services and applications, uh, along with enabling self-service for end users. Next, we have cloud span management. This is a very hot topic of today. Uh, then compliance, ensuring, for example, the developers uh, are provisioning infrastructure and do so safely, properly with, with proper approvals uh, and within the scope of IT defined standards. And then governance over provisioned resources. <clears throat> Here we talk about uh, tracking configuration items, CIs, and having dashboards in place to monitor what's getting provisioned and so on. Uh, one caveat to all of this is that not all cloud management solutions cover all these areas. So, and also not all organizations use a cloud management solution. So, it's not as ubiquitous as ITSM or as cybersecurity. Uh, however, it is gaining ground quickly and we will see why, uh, why, why that is. Okay, so now in the, let's say in the spirit of Star Wars themed presentation today, uh, let's uncover two competing sites that will set the stage for today's presentation and talk to what is the situation that we're dealing with. So first on the dark side uh, of the screen uh, and pun intended, we're talking about hybrid IT complexity. Here, uh, most of us have an idea of what this means. So this could be an enterprise organizations that, uh, that deal with, uh, with, with a private cloud, with multiple public clouds, using various technologies, various tools, uh, they have changing IT strategies. Uh, they are migrating, you know, more uh, of their on-premises resources to the cloud. And all of this is not bad. And uh, as we'll see shortly, these are actually undeniable benefits to taking that approach. 
uh, and we definitely encourage modern uh, modernization. But the one downside or one concern here is also obvious, and it's the increase of complexity, uh, which falls squarely on the shoulders of IT. Now, sometimes this makes organizations more hesitant to even attempt introducing uh, new modern, uh, although complex features. But from this perspective, we want to avoid any such hindrances and, uh, and or inabilities to modernize with the latest and greatest of, uh, of what cloud has to offer. And so to combat that, we also want to present the other side of things. Um, let me, yeah. So here, there is a need to, to offset the challenges of complexities that I described. Uh, and this is with the IT solutions, with IT tools of today uh, that in simple terms provide an ease of management. Uh, this is what IT is always on the lookout for. And this is what helps organizations to essentially avoid pitfalls and costly mistakes uh, or unsuccessful digital transformations. So we will shortly zoom in on cloud management solutions from MicroFocus, but this introduction presents uh, a high level, uh, from a high level, uh, what we're talking about. So arming IT so that they can overcome the complexities uh, and allow organizations to modernize uh, uh, with high speeds and with safety and ease of management. Uh, and in that way, bringing, again, being the team of Star Wars, a balance to the IT ecosystem, uh, allowing for, you know, however complex the, envi the environment might be, uh, to still allow to easily deal with that, uh, with, with whatever may come in the future, uh, having that granular control and oversight uh, in place. So today, uh, really, uh, let's say, in the last two years, actually, we've seen an unprecedented cloud proliferation. Um, if IT was in control, if IT was in control before, uh, there was an event, uh, the pandemic, uh, more specifically two years ago, that caused a disturbance uh, to, to uh, the way things were. So then new initiatives, new approaches were introduced, again, increasing the complexity um, and yeah, new attention is given to digital, uh, digital transformations, to new cloud strategies, migrations, they are realigned budgets, uh, new trainings required to, to train uh, the workforce on new skills and so, and so on. So with that, why, one might ask why then even, um, yeah, why, why even adopt more cloud if things are so complex and so forth? Why are organizations doing that? Well, it's pretty clear. Uh, I, I already mentioned uh, some of it, but here are the five, let's say, key reasons um, as to why. So one is to support the geographically, uh, geographically distributed workforce. So workers are not coming to the office as much anymore. They're working from anywhere and cloud supports that in a much better way. Uh, secondly, uh, different cloud providers, as we know, have different strengths in their technology stacks. And so one advantage is being able to pick and choose from among the best that each cloud has to offer, uh, depending also on the specific business requirements uh, of each organizations, of each organization. So hybrid multi-cloud uh, has become the preferred easy to adopt infrastructure model. Uh, connected with that, uh, point number three, it also uh, assists uh, organizations, companies to avoid the vendor lock-in, and then uh, and then next, uh, also being better able to be agile as well as resilient, in a way future future proofing your IT ecosystem, um, and last on the list here we have to more easily follow regional regulatory mandates. Uh, so, cloud vendor support may vary at different geographical regions. Um, we actually have an example from a Swiss customer uh, who had to make a transition from one, let's say, large cloud vendor to another uh, for a specific application they were using to, to meet that requirement, that uh, mandate. All right, so we saw the new complexities. We talked about why uh, companies are still taking this approach. 
And on this slide, um, let's see how are actually organizations adapting to deal with this complexity um, and restore the balance <laughs> uh, and come out stronger on the other end. So here we have two points of reference that we want to discuss. First, as we've noted, uh, organizations are undergoing digital tr uh, transformations at an increased pace uh, or rather increased volume. Uh, and second point here is a uh, tremendous rise of cloud governance tooling. So in the span of uh, 2020 to 2025 predicted, uh, this is coming from Gartner's cloud management platforms report, um, you know, we'll see a, a, a big rise and we already see that currently in adoption of cloud management solutions. Uh, so this is of course in an effort to bring uh, hybrid multi-cloud complexity under improved control. All right, then this brings us to, to here, uh, kind of summing things up. Uh, and finally, now, before things over to Joe, who will show you some really exciting content that I think you will enjoy, uh, let's bring it all together here um, and show what are the actual challenges and the actual solutions as provided by MicroFocus HCMX, Hybrid Cloud Management X. Now, the first set of challenges have everything to do with delivering, provisioning, uh, infrastructure services, applications, uh, different offerings from various clouds to various environments. Uh, so there is complexity there and there is pressure on IT to deliver uh, at the speed of DevOps. Now, as you observed earlier, we need a proper solution in place, something to combat and tackle these challenges. And for that purpose, let's see a very literal combat <laughs> match and see if the solution can prevail over the uh, imposing challenge that is before us. So let's, uh, let me click that. All right. <laughs> so fortunately, yes, uh, the right side one and the solution is rapid and unified fulfillment, being able to deliver uniformly managed infrastructure. Now we will dig a layer deeper into the solution itself in the following slides, uh, but here we just wanna uncover uh, all the areas of concern. So there are two more and let's identify those. So second challenge is around cloud uh, overspend. Uh, some surveys show that this is actually even uh, number one concern uh, of today's IT uh, organizations. So specifically, there is often a lack of visibility and of proper cloud cost optimization insights. Um, and again, this is something that, uh, again, of course, organizations are looking to, to resolve, to improve. Uh, and let's see another match and keeping finger crossed that we can provide the solution there as well. <laughs> so yes, again, uh, worked out great with cloud spend management uh, and optimization that is provided with HCMX. And then lastly, uh, area that we want to open here is challenges around uh, com uh, compliance violations, uh, this can cause security and operational risks, but also uh, IT needs to be able to enforce standards and rules that are not hindering innovation. So if there is an opportunity for advancement with a different approach, IT should be able to allow for that. Uh, and let's see the, the final showdown uh, here as well. Well, yeah, so this was a bit more intense, uh, but again, we see the solution, policy-based compliance provided by uh, HCMX. So here then we see a closer look at uh, the solutions that we uh, opened on the previous slide. Now we have five circles, five areas here. Uh, we could probably spend an hour on each uh, and add a few more as well. But the goal here really is to kind of give an overview, just let's say a taste of a very key aspects. And hopefully this can help you evaluate if this is something of interest uh, and then further information can, of course, all, always be provided. So starting with the first one, just briefly, um, Hybrid Cloud Management X, HCMX, has a powerful uh, differentiating capability, which is aggregation of offerings from multiple cloud vendors into a single catalog, and then setting proper configurations and making then these offerings easily available to end users. Uh, so that's the first uh, uh, solution, kind of, 
solution we want to address. Second is whether, um, um, yeah, secondly, basically here, either aggregated or starting for, from scratch, uh, HCMX allows IT to graphically design or build cloud and on-prem environments. Uh, so uh, applications or infrastructure, this can be built from hybrid cloud components. So using something from AWS, something from on-prem, something from Azure, this can be really comprehensive and complex um, apps environments that, that help organizations in the best possible way. Uh, so this is done using a drag and drop interface. And in addition to that, HCMX also supports Cloud Slang technology, which allows users to leverage an uh, infrastructure as code approach. So not, not only graphically, but also uh, as code, which is also uh, extremely popular uh, nowadays. And then lastly, in this first section, uh, under rapid unified fulfillment, we have um, uh, IT then, after it builds the offerings, it then publishes these offerings, makes them available to end users through an easy, uh, easy self-service provisioning. So we have a modern self-service uh, portal for end users. Uh, it's also possible to bring HCMX uh, catalog listings under your existing portal of choice, whether you're using uh, ServiceNow or whether you're using uh, our sister product, Smax, you can use the same portal uh, and incorporate HCMX catalog items within that same portal as well. Moving on to uh, Cloud Spend Management. So under Cloud Spend Management, we want to address uh, the fact that cloud cost allocations to consumers uh, need to be uh, very, uh, visible from a granular perspective. So we want to have detailed reports. Uh, we want to avoid any surprise bills. We want to identify uh, who are the biggest spenders um, and track that in, re in real time. Uh, so with HCMX, uh, we track costs with uh, reports that include filtering and tagging capabilities. Uh, included is also a module for managing budgets uh, as well as optimization recommendations uh, to lower your cloud spend based on analytics. So this is another powerful feature uh, that we will see in a little bit. Finally, under policy-based compliance, uh, this is to set rules, access controls, and checks to prevent violations. And uh, Joe will also speak more on that very soon. All right, so this is, let's say, an accompany accompanying slide to the previous one. Uh, to complete the picture, not only does HCMX uh, do all that was discussed, it also offers a broad support across technologies uh, and provides integrations with your most commonly used tools. Uh, this also includes DevOps, uh, CI, CD integrations like Jenkins uh, and service desk, so service desk solutions as well, and also API-based integrations. So here you can see the public clouds that are supported, everything from, of course, AWS, Azure, GCP, and others, uh, support for hypervisors, uh, systems, either modern or legacy. Uh, there is no worry that the HCMX would not have you covered uh, from the integrations technology support perspective as well. And so with that, um, that hopefully paints this uh, overall picture of HCMX, and um, yeah, at this point, I'm handing it over uh, to you, Joe. Uh, take it yep, away. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for that uh, great uh, summary and overview. So hi, guys. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm part of the uh, product management team. Uh, usually, we do these kind of presentations uh, with another product manager, Alex, uh, also called Alex, Alex Savio. Uh, but since this is the afternoon, he's in Bangalore. Uh, I'll try to do my best uh, to take care of, of, uh, of things today. Um, so what we're going to do in the next section is mix things up a little bit. We're going to take a bit of a deep dive on some of the most important use cases. And the way how we're going to do that is we'll first have a slide that describes um, like the problem statement and the solution, like you kind of already see uh, visualized here. And then for each use case, we'll switch over to a short uh, video that shows what the solution looks like uh, when you use it in the, in the product. So yeah, first up, multi-cloud aggregation and uh, customization, what do we mean here? Well, if you want to offer what we call best of breed cloud services to your users across multiple cloud vendors, right? So uh, what we mean here is that maybe you want to host some services from AWS, some other from Azure, 
uh, GCP and, uh, and so on. Then it's a pain if you have to manually first find them, pull them up, compare them by going to each public cloud interface separately, right? So with HCMS, we make that a lot easier for you via that feature that Alex mentioned that is called image aggregation, where you can do all those things that I just described in, uh, in one location, essentially. So from one unified uh, interface. Uh, and of course that's going to save, so why would you do that? Because it's going to save you a lot of pain, a lot of time and, uh, and a lot of headache uh, predominantly. Um, secondly, after this aggregation and brokering of these uh, services, we'll also make it very easy for you to apply governance guardrails and to also customize and tailor the services to your specific needs, right? Every organization here, every, every one of us on the call here, the organization is of course unique uh, so, you know, you almost always need to tweak the services a little bit, uh, installing some additional components, maybe for backup monitoring. And of course, you want to automate all of that uh, so that when someone orders that service, that these things are automatically installed or, or configured. Uh, with HTMX, we make that super easy for you, super conveniently in a graphical interface. We'll see some of that in the, in the video. So as I said, um, I'm going to talk to the slide a little bit, uh, hopefully paint a clear picture of the problem statement and like generically how we solve it. And now we're going to show a short, short video. So um, Alex, let's see if we can roll the first video to see what this looks like in the product. This image aggregation, or in other words, the ability of HCMX to aggregate public cloud service offerings into its catalog next to offerings that are fulfilled on premises, for instance, by the local VMware environment. And we support this type of aggregation for all leading public cloud platforms, including AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. And since Google Cloud Platform was added most recently, I'm going to use this one for my short demo. So here we see cloud providers that are available for image aggregation. You can see them on the left here in the left column. Uh, some are public, some are private. And in this case, I have selected only Google Cloud Platform so that we just see the offerings that are available on that cloud. Now, there can be thousands of these offerings, of course, so we allow you to sift through them using string search, where you might be looking for things like SQL servers, uh, or maybe you want to use Ubuntu servers. And in this case, I'm going to work with the first one in the list here, so I select it. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the cool things you can do with image aggregation is add additional governance governance in terms of where this service can be provisioned geographically and also governance in terms of what configurations are allowed in terms of resources so cpu and ram once you have configured everything as you want it to be then you can generate a cost overview matrix where you can get an idea about what each of these configurations is going to cost in every location that's allowed so if that all looks good then you can click the import button and if you publish the offering right away as i'm doing here then on the next click the offering will be available to your users in the hcmx catalog alternatively before you publish it you can first load the aggregated public cloud service offering into the service designer and this is the same service designer that you use to create service offerings that are fulfilled on premises based on service designs that you create from scratch and you can use the service designer to, for instance, add additional components like you see me do here, all graphically. Now, a quick word on our service designs. These are essentially blueprints for multi-tier apps that you either create yourself or that are auto-generated for aggregated services. And they can be very easily tweaked for all sorts of end-user requests. Now, similarly, you can use the orchestration UI to build additional automation in and around your aggregated service offering, for instance, to add monitoring or backup and we ship with thousands of workflows out of the box to help you just do that. So we have a tile-based top-level organization and clicking on a tile brings your users to a list of relevant published cloud service offerings where they can easily find the cloud service they need, request a subscription to that service, provide some configuration details, and then submit that request for automatic fulfillment. So instead of navigating through the tiles, I can click on the virtual agent icon at the top here, ask the virtual agent for what I need, which is a WordPress service in this case, then the virtual agent will present me with some options that match my request. I select the one that I like best. And from that point on, the experience is very similar to what we saw earlier, where I provide some configuration details and then submit my request for automatic fulfillment. 
Okay, great. Can you can you hear me again? Just checking for audio. Hello? Yes, yes. Oh yeah, good. <laughs> thanks for confirming. I uh, yeah, but look, thanks for editing it the way you did. That was really good. So we saw basically consumption via the catalog in a graphical way. And of course, we also have an API for this. Uh, and in addition to that, as Alex was already hinting at, we're also working on a way to order services via code as well. So an infrastructure as code way, but we'll talk about that uh, in our roadmap, roadmap section because that's something that, uh, that that's coming. Okay, before we get to that, uh, second core use case of today uh, deals with cloud spends. And the problem here should be very familiar to all of you. We certainly have it within MicroFocus. Uh, and it's, it's the fact that if you don't properly govern cloud spend, uh, it's almost certainly going to spin out of control. Uh, teams are just going to consume, 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 right? In the public cloud, there's no limits as to what uh, you can consume. Uh, and at the end of the month, you may end up with a bill uh, that's, that's higher than what you <laughs> were expecting, basically. Uh, several features uh, in this area and the products to help you counter that. Uh, we have our uh, centralized billing reports that Alex was talking about. So we'll, we'll see those in action in a minute. Uh, you can indeed apply very advanced filters there um, based on tags that you have in the cloud, but we also have a feature called ex dynamic expressions that allow you to essentially almost, you know, compute additional tags, virtual tags that you can then use in your, uh, in, for instance, like a more advanced solution, like maybe a Power BI or anything that you wanna uh, connect to that. Uh, that's more of a reactive approach, right? Because if you're slicing and dicing reports, that means the bill already came in, the bill was too high, and now you want to figure out why was that so that you can remediate it. But that's that's still always a reactive approach. Uh, we also have some proactive features in the products uh, in terms of um, auto recommended, uh, I would say, uh, well, auto generated, I should say, recommendations uh, to optimize specifically around reserved instances. Uh, so reserved instances is a, like a, a core domain where you should look at if you want to uh, reduce your, your, overall cloud, your overall cloud spend. Uh, and then we also have a feature that, called, that is called cloud limits. Uh, very simple. Uh, you can, uh, in essence, uh, set a cloud limit, a spend limit uh, to a cloud account, right? You can do that natively in the public cloud interfaces as well. But the nice thing here in our product is that you can do it, again, across all these clouds in one location. And you can see all the limits and who is violating them, who's going, who's spending more uh in, an, in one nice aggregated view so that's that's really nice okay let's roll uh let's roll the tape maybe again and see what uh, what that looks like alex then another great feature in hcmx are our public cloud cost reports and these are important because as we have seen hcmx allows you to aggregate public cloud services in the catalog so as your users start consuming these services, they are going to create expenses on your public cloud cost bill. And you want to keep track of that so that there are no surprises when you receive your invoice from your preferred cloud provider or, uh, or providers. Now, to do all this, we ship out of the box reports that show you your overall spend, of course, uh, and that spend split out over things like locations, products and accounts. And this allows you to easily pin down where the biggest spenders are in your organization. Now, on top of that, we also implemented an expression-based metadata feature that you can use to automatically link certain expenses to cost centers. And you can see that at the bottom here, I have used that feature to configure a cost center expression. And I have two cost centers defined, Fort Collins and Provo. Now, if I write the expression in a way so that it recognizes certain locations and accounts, then it's going to automatically link the costs made by these locations or by these accounts to the right cost center. And this allows for immediate filtering. So if I select, for instance, the Provo cost center here, then right away my view gets filtered for that particular cost center. And as you can imagine, this makes it very, very easy to implement chargeback to business units if this is something that fits into your financial operations model. So cost reports are a great way to understand where money is being spent and to make adjustments after the fact. But we also ship with a feature that can help you to reduce your cloud costs proactively by managing what we call reserved instances. And reserved instances are like tickets that you purchase for public cloud services that you'll be using for a longer period of time, for instance, for a whole year. And if you link such a ticket, such a reserved instance ticket to that service, 
then you're going to get a better price for it because you commit for a longer period of time. So this is a great way of saving costs. But the challenge here, of course, is to know which instances are good candidates. So what we did is we implemented some analytics that look at past usage and that will then make recommendations on which instances you should convert to reserved instances. And if we take a look at the dashboard for this feature, then we can see an overall score at the top here that gives you an idea on how well your, your coverage is overall. Then you see below that uh, a graph per cloud provider that gives you a little bit more detail uh, per cloud provider. And then on the right, we see the individual recommendations and you can drill down on those and then in the detailed view you will see what each recommendation is suggesting what it's going to save you on a monthly basis and and so on and of course uh, besides uh, recommendations for new reserved instances we will also generate warnings about existing reserved instances that are about to expire so that you can renew them well in time This allows us to make quite accurate budget predictions. And here you see an example of a set of configured business budgets where we are able to show, of course, their, their, their current status, but also their projected status so that business owners can really make you know, well-informed decisions early on things like budget adjustments. Okay, thanks. And that last view with the budgets, that was essentially a view in our financial module. So you have the reporting module. Uh, and that's where the first part of the movie came from. And then that second part uh, of the movie was the financial module, where indeed we have uh, items modeled like cost centers, uh, budget center. Um, uh, and you can, of course, link them, link them together and then track expenses that are made uh, via a feature that's called expense lines to... Uh, Two budgets that's kind of where you finally want uh, want them to end up okay the last core use case that we uh, at least that we have time for today deals with infrastructure uh, compliance right we live in dynamic times where practices like devops and agile makes teams scream for more flexibility that's always what they want we want it faster we want it more flexible but at the same time uh, it of course needs to make sure that there are some baselines uh, in place right some baseline guardrails to prevent compliance violations because compliance violations usually means uh, security risks, right? I'm thinking about things like misconfigured firewalls, using unpatched cloud images, uh, opening ports that are not supposed to be opened and so on and so on. And it's a makes us kind of a two prong approach here where it uses a combination of, of reactive again and proactive measures um, where uh, if we talk about reactive first, right? Where uh, existing non-compliant infrastructure is flagged Right, as soon as possible, because you want to know if something you know, if something is not complied or there, you want to basically be warned about that. Uh, but on the proactive side as well, so what we're going to do is we're going to block deployments uh, or attempted deployments that we know that are not compliant from being provisioned. Right. So on one hand, we stop uh, non-compliant provisionings from happening. And on the other hand, if uh, there are uncompliant provisions out there, and that's, of course, always possible because policies can change. Right. An AMI may be allowed on day one. But on day two, this AMI may not be on the bad list. So now a VM that uses that AMI all of a sudden is, is uh, not compliant. Right? So you need to actually you need to be both reactive and proactive to have a 360 degree coverage. Um, so that's kind of our story around uh, around compliance. And we also have a short video about this. Uh, the voice you will hear this time is the, the voice of Alex, so the, uh, my, uh, my colleague product manager. So let's roll it. Let's take a look. What happens when the company introduces a new policy or a new standard that the production service uh, should not have memory size more than 16 GB? Now we must consider this policy applies not only to the future service request. We also want to identify any past requests, that is the existing VMs that violate this new policy, which requires VMs only 16 GB or less. The admin can create a simple policy which can help identify the list of VMs that are greater than 16 GB. There are of course number of policies that the admin can add based on the number of conditions and along with that it can be categorized across different scenarios. But here we will only be using this simple example. So David wants to identify the list of VMs which are Unix, 
and having memory size greater than 16 GB. So the condition can be added like I explained. This report gives David the information about the list of VMs which are non-compliant as you see here. There are three VMs as you see which are having memory size greater than 16 GB. So here is the sample widget uh, which explains the list of compliance item and non-compliance item. And along with that while creating a compliance report, the admin can add any number of policies based on the applied use case here. Okay, short and sweet, love it. Um, good. Let's move to um, to the next slide. What's next? Uh, All right. A quick question: Do we oh, want to skip the poll in the interest of time, or um, for, do we have until the hour or forty-five minutes? Uh, the hour. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Let, let's move. Yeah, on. you can do yeah, that. Yeah. First time, we don't need to skip. Uh, you want to skip it no. or not? You want to do the poll? Let's uh, let's quickly do the poll. Thirty seconds. Sure. All right. I'll speed up some All other right. stuff. Move back to the proper slide. Okay. Uh, yeah. So thanks for most of you in the audience. The question will be clear, but I'm going to talk to the slide a little bit to uh, give you some time to find the widgets and uh, select the right option for you. Basically, what we're after here, we want to kind of know what you're using today to manage your. Uh, your cloud spend, right? So first option, did you did you buy something like a commercial uh, offering to help you manage your cloud spend? Uh, then choose the first one, please. Uh, second one, a lot of companies actually use a homegrown approach where usually they will combine uh, an Excel sheet with something, uh, some, some tools that, that they programmed themselves, uh, maybe with some um, Python data analytics tool, something like that. So if that's your approach, select number two. Uh, maybe you're already using HCMX, uh, we would love that. So in that case, please select option three. And then if you're not using anything today, uh, you know, select option four. And then of course, uh, yeah, if you wanna to talk to us to see how we can help you optimize your cloud spend. Uh, if you're not doing anything for sure, there will be options how you can uh, reduce your bill a little bit. So A, B, C, or D. Um, Let's maybe uh, discuss the result at the end if we have time. We were normally going to discuss the results in real time, but let's maybe do that. Uh, oh, you know what? No, let's put it on screen. It's good for, for people here to see kind of what peers are having. So let's quickly take a look at the results just because uh, I'm interested as well. Are people still entering answers, Alex? What's happening? Uh, Lorita, are you? Uh... Oh, okay. Sorry about that. No worries, yeah. no worries. So uh, yeah, the poll just popped up, uh, I think. So I'm not gonna answer it, so I'm just gonna close it, but the poll should have just popped up for everyone. So go ahead and select your uh, option. So again, uh, third-party tool, option number one, uh, homegrown solution. Uh, probably you'll have to use Excel sheets then. I don't see how otherwise you would do it, or at least CSVs. So uh, option number two, you use our product, option number three. And then if you don't use anything at the moment, optimize option number four. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna close as to not bias the results. Uh, good, so third party uh, Excel sheet. That's kind of interesting, uh, a tie for third party and Excel sheets. Uh, and there's still some opportunities for 25% of the group. Uh, no one is using our tool at the moment. So take a look at it. It might do some stuff uh, that's interesting for you that, that your current solutions cannot do. Um, thanks, good info. Okay, I'm gonna close this. So let's move on. Oh. oh yeah, the movies. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a couple of slides coming up about uh, the benefits of SaaS, but we before we do that, very briefly, I wanna stay within the hour. Uh, talk, we're gonna talk about a little bit about recognition. So industry recognition comes in two categories, analysts and of course, customer testimonials. Uh, in terms of analysts, do take a look at these reports, right? They're linked on our website, very easy to find. If you have subscriptions with them, you know, it's the usual suspect, right? Forrester, RIA, Carter. Uh, if you have subscriptions with them directly, pull down the report. 
we would love you to do that because they say very, very positive things about our product. Uh, so we're convinced if you read the report that this will very much be in our benefit. Uh, let's move to the slide with the customer testimonial. Uh, we picked the, our most recent one, right? This is not our most recent win. This is our most recent public win for which we have uh, a public story. Uh, I'm very happy with these guys, Air France, Scale Lab, uh, one of the major airlines in, in uh, Europe. They partner with Delta here in the US. Uh, so they're part of the Sky Team Alliance. So chances are you've flown with them um, like either in code share or maybe even directly like uh, within France. Uh, they've been with us all along their cloud management journey, starting with the predecessor products for, for HCMX, like CSA and HCM. Uh, so those were the first products we had and that evolved into HCMX and then now migrated to HCMX. Uh, they're happy, we're happy. Uh, they were basically still able, if coming, even coming from HCM, which is already a fairly recent product, uh, to speed up things with a factor of three by moving to HCMX. When I say speed up, is the service delivery again, right? The time between uh, a user requesting a service and then that service being fully provisioned, rolled out, uh, all the necessary components installed, like backup monitoring and ready to go to be used by the ops team or the dev team. Um, so yeah, that story is of course also on our website. So please do go check it out. Easy to find via our case study uh, link on microfocus.com. All right, moving on to SaaS. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the benefits uh, of SaaS. I'm sure you all know what SaaS entails. And this is part of the reason why we're doing this webinar because the, the big new thing that is very recent for HCMX is that you can now consume it as SaaS, right? Uh, and I'm sure you all know what SaaS means, but just to be 120% sure, uh, it means that we are hosting the product for you, right? So you don't have to install it, you don't have to patch it, you don't have to upgrade it, you don't have to worry about availability, you don't have to worry about uptime, security, all of those worries now fall on our shoulders, microfocus. Um, and broadly speaking, like that approach leads to four categories for benefits. Uh, and they're all four on the screen now, so I'm just going to talk to them left to right. So there's a benefit in terms of adoption, right? No installation yeah. hassles involved. Uh, essentially, everything that's there is like a short training by our uh, brilliant customer success management team. Uh, they do a short training and then you're ready to go. And also new features and functionality just keeps flowing to you without you having to install patches or upgrade. The features just pop up. Uh, you still have to read the documentation, of course, otherwise you wouldn't know how to, um, how to use the feature. Uh, but yeah, it's just, just effortless from your side. SaaS is also um, very flexible. Um, the model is subscription-based. SaaS does not have to be subscription-based, but in 90% of the cases, uh, it will be. And uh, we are no exception uh, there. And that also brings um, an advantage for you where you can start small and then scale up and scale down as you need, right? And especially that latter part, that is not possible in a traditional model where you have licenses that you purchase, right? Because when you buy licenses, you own them. There's like a certain cost. And when you need to scale down, which hopefully, of course, in a, in a perfect world, it's never gonna happen. But from a peace of mind perspective, from your side, if you wanna scale down, you cannot give licenses back. But with subscriptions at every renewal point, you can basically tweak how many subscriptions you have uh, according to what your current business need is, right? So SaaS is very much a model where you know, the, the balance of power shifts to the consumer, um, but we're very happy to do that for you. So, so avoiding underutilization, that's, that's, an, uh, that's what you can see on the slide there. Uh, that is the, the key point that you wanna go after here with, with the SaaS model. Thirdly, better TCO, it should give you a better TCO, right? You might be paying the same amount in terms of subscriptions and what you would pay in, in terms of traditional maintenance. But remember, TCO is broader than just you know, that money that, that you pay. It's also, uh, you have to take in, into consideration the fact that you don't need to install uh, the product on hardware that you need to purchase, right? We do that again for you. And there are no infrastructure and software management costs as well, right? All of that shifts to microfocus. Um, and then finally, subscriptions are easy. I think we all have, uh, it's a model that we're all used to. So we all probably have some subscription here and there. I certainly do. Uh, so it scales, you know, the cost scales linearly with consumption. Everything is included, like your support, your CSM. It just makes doing business uh, a lot easier. All right. I hope uh, this slide has nothing to do with HCMX as such, right? This is this, the advantages here are, I would say, an advantage across the board if you go SaaS for any, uh, any, any product that you would use. But it's still important to be, uh, to be aware of them. Um, very quick word, next, si next slide about Optic. That is the platform on which HMX is built. Again, as 
on SaaS, you don't need to worry about this because uh, again, we run it for you. But just so you know, it's built on the very latest container-based ultra-scalable technologies. Of course, Kubernetes, special Kubernetes that we, uh, we tweak and we made enterprise ready for you. So the idea here is that we just want to convey that it's absolutely ready to host your business, no matter what, uh, what you want to scale to. All right, 10 minutes left, let's do this. Uh, let's talk a little bit about a roadmap, what's coming in 2022. Uh, lots of stuff, of course, but in the time that's, that we have in this webinar, we want to zoom in on two key pieces of technology that we're working on. And the first one is this, the Snow plugin, we call it. It's, of course, ServiceNow, so the ServiceNow plugin. And essentially, this plugin allows you to uh, use a, what we call the fulfillment power of HCMX in combination with the Snow catalog, right? Uh, fulfillment automation is definitely a differentiator for HCMX. We have invested heavily in this for the last five years. Um, and we want to make that differentiator available to, organization, to organizations that have decided to use Snow as the front end, so uh, where the catalog actually runs in, uh, in Snow. So this, you could technically do it via the API, but it's, it's a bit of a hassle, of course. You need to know how to, uh, how to do that. Uh, but this new plugin is going to make it super easy, right, to publish HCMX service offerings into the Snow catalog that are then fulfilled by HCMX if someone orders them in the Snow, in the snow catalog. Okay, our next roadmap item deals with uh, infrastructure as code. So we have a short poll. Uh, no, let's go back to the, to the poll. Yeah, thank you. Because we're going to talk about infrastructure as code, we're uh, interested in learning a little bit if you already use it. Uh, and again, please, uh, Florida, pull up the, the poll and I'm just going to talk about it while People will, without a doubt, know what to do, but I'm just going to talk about it to fill, fill the air a little bit. So are you using as your organization? I we're asking you to, to select the one that is predominantly in use because you may use several technologies, um, but the one that's kind of your strategic choice, the one that you think is the one for you going forward. Uh, is it Terraform open source, right? So the CLI open source based version. Is it Terraform Cloud Enterprise? Uh, Cloud Enterprise are kind of the same, but Cloud, again, is the SaaS offering and Enterprise is kind of the same thing with a couple of additional features if you run it uh, on-premises. Uh, CloudFormation, that's AWS, right? So that's AWS CloudFormation. So, you know, uh, writing the JSON there. Um, Azure Resource Manager ARM template. So that would probably mean you're using BICEP. So BICEP is the language. It's the equivalent of HCL in, uh, in Terraform. So the, the language to, uh, to make it a little bit easier. Uh, it's form of an enhanced JSON there. Uh, Cloud Slang uh, or something else. Uh, maybe you uh, are very, very much bleeding edge and you're already using Pulumi. Uh, so let us know kind of what, uh, I'm just going to close it. So I don't want to bias. So can we take a look? Is uh, no ESC used? Oh, this is actually interesting. So um, yeah, definitely look into, you're probably looking into IC because it's kind of where things are moving towards, like GitOps, uh, having your declarative uh, definitions checked in and something like that. Uh, CloudFormation IC and then ARM templates. Uh, this I'm a little bit surprised that uh, it's it's uh, happy to see it, of course, but AWS and Azure uh, surpassing uh, Terraform here. Uh, interesting, interesting. All right, thank you for that, uh, beloved audience. Uh, good. All right, let's move to um the next slide let's pull it up let's put all the animations um right so why did we ask this question about ic because in 2020 we plan to release a new module in the product that is called ic gateway and in a nutshell it's going to wrap governance around existing infrastructure code technologies like as you can see on the screen here and that we mentioned terraform uh bicep for uh azure and then cloud formation for aws um so this is kind of why we were asking this uh, this question. So you know, I said, okay, we're going to wrap governance around IC. What does that mean? So let's move to the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the things we're, we're planning to do. So first of all, uh, jump to light speed here. I love it. <laughs> uh, we're going to make sure that all deployments are compliant, right? Um, IC is really cool, but, um, and again, when I say IC, I mean IAC, infrastructure as code. I'm going to use the acronym here, but uh, it also, typically provisions directly in the cloud. If I use Terraform as an example, if you hand over your HCL file to Terraform and you say, yeah, Terraform apply, it's going to create things uh, in the cloud. So it's very easy uh, for people to create things that are, again, non-compliant, right? So I wanna make sure with, uh, with IC Gateway is that all deployments that are being done are compliant, again, to eliminate security threats, right? That come from those non-compliant deployments. And we gave some examples earlier, misconfigured firewalls, 
people using the wrong AMI and unpatched one, um, some other examples, ports that are not, not supposed to be opened. Maybe they create EBS storage and they forget to enable encryption uh, or they accidentally <laughs> set it on public while well, it should be private, things like that. Um, so again, with IC Gateway, we're going to have again that combination of reactive and proactive governance that we discussed there. Because again, in order to be one 100% 360 degree covered, you need both, you always need both. Um, but IC uh, Gateway is going to be essentially bring in some additional features that are needed if you want to do that specifically for infrastructure as code, because the infrastructure as code works differently. There is no catalog in the infrastructure as code world, right? Um, so to start, uh, let's start again with the reactive verification. Uh, again, we're going to detect here and flag non-compliance deployments. Uh, and IC Gateway is, act is actually automatically going to link these flag deployments to the IC code that created them. And this is really nice, right? Because in the DevOps world, you have this culture that people should fix uh, their own thing. Uh, but the problem is always making that link between, oh, I centralized discovered that a certain VM is using the wrong AMI. But now you need to map that back to the, let's say the Terraform file, uh, the IC file that contains the definition, the, the, the declaration for that particular machine. Right? So we're going to automate that all the way uh, through. Um, maybe even sending an email to the developer that says, hey, uh, uh, for sure he, he or she will see it in the UI. But also an email that says, hey, this is not, not compliant uh, anymore. This is how you fix it. And by the way, this is basically where uh, it is in your, uh, in your code. Um, for the proactive part, we will again block deployments, but um, again, in an IC unique way where we're going to inspect the codes, right? So um, again, as I described it earlier, the problem usually arises because people are allowed to write code, give it to Terraform and then deploy it. We're going to intercept these requests, uh, inspect the codes, and then see if uh, those same sets of policies that you use for the reactive side are now also respected for the proactive side. And if that's not the case, then we're going to block the deployment and send it again back to the developer before it was deployed so that he or she can, again, easily find the code. We'll make that easy as well, fix it, and then try again uh, to deploy it. Uh, so I was still talking about the very, very first bullet point on the slide here. Secondly, uh, IC Gateway is going to do a lot of things as well for, for the financial side. Um, and that's what we want to do is allow the team leads specifically, every developer, but also specifically the team leads, like think project manager or value stream manager to have a good grip on, on, on finances, right? So these roles need to be able to see the exact costs of what their team is, is spending because it's these people who get the email from finance at the end of the month or the quarter saying, hey, your team went over budget. Can you take a look why that was? So IT needs to give these people the tools so that they can actually figure out why that was, right? They need to be able to look at the past, so to say, uh, and then basically they need to be able to see, okay, my team, what IC deployments did they make? Uh, what was the total cost at the end of the month, but also were there spikes, unexpected spikes, right? Spike can be normal if there was hardening, but if you see a spike in a certain deployment and there was no hardening, then you can start looking at what, why did that thing spike? And again, we'll make it super easy to like jump to the actual codes uh, so that you can like run a quick debug on it and uh, maybe it was misconfigured or uh, but that's as the developer can then dive in and fix, uh, fix the problem so that it won't generate a cost spike again in the next term. And then the last one, yeah, we'll wrap life, life cycle management around uh, the deployments. Why do we do that? Um, well, it's, it's, you have the workspaces, right? If I, again, use Terraform as the example here, you have a Terraform workspace. What we want to do is wrap a, a life cycle around it so that that workspace essentially has like a birth date, a lifespan, and then a suggested end date. Um, and the reason why we do that is this solves the problem of workspaces like deployments with IC that are created, but then forgotten, uh, maybe by developers, maybe by the pipeline, because uh, this is usually a very large contributor as well to why you're going over your budget, right? People creating things, not cleaning them up. Uh, and at, at the end of the month, you have to go over a long list and say, hey, uh, uh, Pete, do you, do you still need this one? Uh, Mary, do you still need like this? Uh, do you still, no. If we wrap it in a subscription, we can automate all that, right? We can send an email to people and say, hey, automate it. This thing, do you still need it? Yes, renew your subscription to it or no. If you don't get a reply, you clean it up automatically. Uh, so again, this is going to massively allow you to um, save on your cost bill. Forward-looking stuff, maybe you're thinking, hey, this is interesting. When is this available? Can I give you, again, this roadmap, I won't give you an exact uh, date here, but it's not too far away. Let me, uh, let me say that. 
And in the meantime, if you thought that those things that I was just describing are interesting for you and you could use some of those, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we're very easy to reach the, the PM team. So you can see our email address there on the screen, HCM uh, Hotel Charlie Mike dash PM, says product management at microfocus.com. Um, yeah, just with any question or if you want to participate, we have an early access program for the IC gateway running as well, uh, starting to run, starting to run in summer. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, reach out to me uh, and Alex as well for more information. Okay, that's all I had. Back over to you, Alex. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, let's wrap up. Uh, to conclude here, just a refresher, an overview of uh, capabilities we've covered today, along with what we discussed, which has benefits, roadmap, uh, results with customers and analysts. Uh, we hope you found, found this infor uh, content uh, information valuable today um and hopefully enjoyable as well so yeah this is the you know the uh powerful tool that we that we presented and uh lastly you know for any more information next steps um you can request a free trial or a demo or you can write to, to our team um as joe mentioned on our web page there is a plethora of documents and, that you can find as well um and yeah, let's let's then move to. Um, I don't know if we have. I don't know how we are with time, but um, maybe we ran out. But maybe if there is time for one or two questions, um, maybe if not, then let's go to the games. Uh, either case, Larita, I'm handing it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Joe. Um, I think we have time for one question before we kick it over to the trivia. And that question is, how does adding SMACs with HCMX work? You want to take it, Alex, or you want me to take it? Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yep. It kind of, um, the short answer is it's very easy. It ties into that slide that we showed a little bit earlier where we had that optic platform, uh, both SMACs and it's, and when I say SMEX, for those who don't know it, SMEX stands for SMA X, uh, Service Management Automation X, which is our uh, IT service management product, kind of also very similar to, uh, to Snow. Um, and it runs on the same platform, uh, the same OPIC platform. So for those who are like a bit more technically inclined on this call, if you have HMX running on OPIC and you license SMEX, then all that the cluster needs to do is download additional containers that have the microservices for SMEX. Uh, and then all of a sudden, SMEX is there for you. Now, you don't have to do it manually, right? That is done automatically. Uh, but because they run on the same platform, it's, it's almost transparent for you uh, if you start with HCMX and then later you want to you wanna add SMEX. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's super easy. And of course, if you run in SMEX, you don't see anything, right? It just that those containers get downloaded to the, the, the SMEX farm that we host. Uh, and all of a sudden you, you have SMEX features. So 